Please turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm number 8, which is page 450 in the Pew Bible. We want to consider Psalm number 8 this morning, this beautiful little psalm that speaks of creation and the glory of God. As you turn there, let me pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful creation. We thank you for the signs of spring that Lindy has just spoken of. We thank you, God, that your glory is declared in this beautiful creation, in this beautiful world, in the seasons, in so many things around and about us. Oh, God, as we meditate upon Psalm 8 this morning, Lord, may our hearts be full of joy for your glory and for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 8, beginning to read at verse number 1. This is the word of God. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So speaks the word of the living God. Psalm 8 is a little big psalm. I don't know that anyone else has said that, but I said it just now. It's a little big psalm in the sense that it is small in size, but grand in its subject. It's small in its size. It's only nine verses long, but it's grand in its subject. The theme of Psalm 8 is the greatness of God and the place of mankind within God's universe. A truly magnificent subject. Derek Kidner is an Old Testament scholar, and in his commentary, he writes these words, and I quote, This psalm is an unsurpassed example of what a hymn should be celebrating as it does the glory and grace of God, rehearsing who he is and what he has done, and relating us and our world to him, all with a masterly economy of words and in a spirit mingled with joy and awe. End of quote. This little psalm is about the greatness and the glory and the grace of God. And yet the place that God has given to humanity within his creation that displays his glory. It's a little bit like this in terms of man's relation to the creation and to the glory of God. It's a little bit like this. Imagine trying to explain to someone what a spark plug is. Someone who has never heard of a spark plug. Well, to explain the spark plug, you need to explain the internal combustion engine. To explain the wonder of mankind, the psalmist begins by declaring the glory and grace of God. To explain the wonder of mankind, the psalmist begins by declaring the glory and grace of God. That's what the psalmist David is trying to do in Psalm number 8. 
David is reflecting upon the fatherly kindness of God toward humanity, toward men and women, boys and girls. And he does not simply offer praise to God, but he is enthralled in his meditation upon the glory and grace of God for mankind. David is enthralled by God's grace toward humanity. And the place that God has given to people in the created order. And so the psalm does not begin with man. And when I say man, I mean male and female. The psalm does not begin with man, but with God. In verses 1 and 2, we see the, the majesty of God. We see the glory of God. Verse number one, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Calvin tells us that God's name, God's name is the knowledge of his character and his perfections. So when David speaks of the name of God, he is using the name of God to refer to the greatness of God's character and his perfections. How great is the name of God? How great are the perfections of God? You have set them above the heavens. The psalm begins by declaring that God is the Lord, O Lord, our Lord. A few weeks ago, we looked at these names for God, and we know that the word Lord there in the upper case is God's special name that he revealed to Moses and to Israel. It speaks of the fact that God is a covenant God. He has chosen a people, and he is his people's redeemer and deliverer. This is what the name Lord means, L-O-R-D in capitals. O Lord, our deliverer and our redeemer. O Lord, our Lord. So the first name is the name Jehovah, meaning our covenant God who delivers us and redeems us. But the second name for God in the lower case, is Adonai. This word means that God can be designated as our master, as an earthly ruler. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. God is literally, O Jehovah, or Adonai. Jehovah is majestic, and his glory is so great, it is above the heavens. Do you remember Solomon picking up on this at the time of the uh, opening of the temple there in Jerusalem? Solomon had built this great temple in Jerusalem for the people of God to worship their God. And Solomon declared these words, the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. And this is the point that the psalmist is making here, that David is making in Psalm 8. Even the heavens cannot, declare, cannot contain the glory of God. God's glory is above the heavens. God's glory is above the creation. The creation is wonderful. The creation is beautiful. The creation declares the glory of God. But the creation cannot exhaust the glory of God. God's glory is above and beyond his creation. <clears throat> Nothing under the heavens can adequately declare the glory of God. And so the psalmist writes, Our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Your great character, 
your great works. You have set your glory above the heavens. The majesty of God. Our God is so great and so glorious that the heavens cannot fully, the creation cannot fully declare his glory. And yet he reveals his glory on the lips of children. Isn't this a wonderful verse, verse 2? Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength. Or in the NIV translation, which I prefer, you have ordained praise. You have ordained praise from the lips of children and infants. Do you remember that occasion when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the day of his triumphal entry on a donkey? And the children of Jerusalem cried out, Hosanna is the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. And Jesus referred on that occasion to Psalm 8. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? God has ordained praise. You see, God does not wait till men arrive at the age of maturity. But even from the very dawn of infancy shines forth so brightly his glory that it is sufficient to confute all the ungodly. God can stop the mouths of the wicked by the praise of children, such as his glory. Isn't that a tremendous thought? He does not need to wait for our maturity. He does not wait, need to wait until we know it all. You're meant to laugh. Such is the glory of our God. His glory is above the heavens. His glory issues forth from the lips of little children, confounding the ungodly. I love that verse in Psalm 138, which I quoted in the pastoral prayer, Psalm 138 and verse number two. If you have a Bible, turn there with me. Psalm 38 and verse two says, I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. The glory of God the glory of God is seen in his name, in his great character. The glory of God is declared through his word, his true word. In the book of Hebrews, and in chapter number one, And in verse 2, we read this. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom all, and through whom also he created the world. Speaking of Jesus Christ, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. God has created this world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one whom God appointed to create the world. And yet Jesus Christ is the one who finally and fully reveals to us God and the glory of God. An amazing thought. 
that God has created this world through his Son, that the Lord Jesus Christ upholds this world by the power of his word. And yet Jesus Christ, God in flesh, is God's final and fullest word to us of the glory of God. Jesus Christ is God's revelation to us of the glory of God. In verses one and two, we see the majesty and glory of God. But in verses three to eight, we see the glory of man. And of course, most of the psalm is given over to the glory of man. And the first thing that can be asserted about mankind is his significance in this creation. Verse 3, when I look at the heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? How astonishing is it that the God of this vast universe, that the creator of this vast world, how astonishing is it that the God who made it and who orders it should think of us and should care for us. Such is the grace of God. What is man that you are mindful of him? Truly, we are insignificant. We are insignificant in one sense in this vast creation. And yet God thinks of us and cares for us and shows us his undeserved kindness. This is the grace of God. We see this grace of God. We see this grace of God and this glory that God shines on, on mankind in a number of ways in these verses three through eight. Look at verse four. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? One of the greatest ways that God has been mindful of man is that God has made man in his own image. Of all the creatures in the creation, both in heaven and on earth, God has imprinted on mankind the image of God. The triune God can be seen in this humble creature called man, male and female. God's glory is reflected in mankind in a way that it is not in the rest of the creation. What is man that you're mindful of him? Verse 5, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Not only do we see the image of God here in mankind, but we see the dominion of God in mankind. God has made man, male and female, to rule over the creation. Verse 6, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Isn't this an amazing thing? I remember as a child living in farm country, I was amazed at a huge 1,000 pound bull would fear me as a little boy. God has put the fear of creation, or God has put the fear of man, I should say, in creation. You have given him dominion. You have given him your image.
You know, as I read through these verses here in this second section of Psalm number eight, I can't think, I, I can't stop but think that David was thinking here of Genesis chapter one. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Isn't David clearly thinking of the works of creation? Isn't David clearly thinking of Genesis 1? You see, it is the privilege and duty of men and women and boys and girls to look beyond the beasts. It is our privilege and our duty to look beyond the creation and to set our minds on the things that are above. Not the angels, but God, and on Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. This is the purpose of Psalm 8. In the Septuagint translation of this verse, in the Old Testament, Psalm 8, And verse number five, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. In the Septuagint, it reads, you have made him a little lower than God. Elohim, and it's in the plural. You have made him a little lower than the triune God. Speaking of mankind. Such is the glory that God has given to man to reign and to rule and to be the image bearer of God in this creation. Such is the grace of God in Christ toward man. Surely we see the Lord Jesus Christ in these verses, don't we? You have made him a little lower and crowned him with glory and honor. Do we not see a picture here of the Son of Man? I think we do. If you've still got your Bible in your hand, turn to Hebrews chapter two. The writer to the Hebrews clearly interprets these verses to apply firstly to Christ. Speaking of the author and the founder of our salvation, Hebrews chapter two and verse nine, putting everything in, his, in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who is for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting, verse 10 of Hebrews chapter two, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. The writer to the Hebrews, in essence, is saying that Christ was made in our flesh a little lower for the purpose of saving us. We see here, don't we, in Psalm 8 and in Hebrews 2, the grace of God in Jesus Christ. There's an inscription in this pulpit And the inscription is, sir, we would see Jesus. We see Jesus in Psalm 8. We see the glory of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ that God would take on flesh and become a man 
for us? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? It's because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ that he cares for us. It's because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ that Jesus would come into this world and suffer and die. Notice how David ends the psalm. He goes right back to where he began, doesn't he? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He wants us to look up. He wants us to look to the grace of God. He wants us to look to the one who is seated at the right hand of the glory who became low for us. I remember when I was a child, sometimes adults would ask me my name, as adults often do with children. Little boy, what's your name? Or little girl, what's your name? Maybe they don't put it quite that way in the United States, but I would tell them my name. My name is Mark Dunn, sir. And they wouldn't know who I, they wouldn't know me. But after a while, I learned something. If I said, well, my father is Robert Dunn, or if I said my grandfather is John Dunn, then they would respond, yes, I know who you are. I know who you are. You see, the children of God are known by their father. The glory of God and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is seen in the children of God. It is a wonderful thing to be known, isn't it? It's a terrible thing when people don't know you, but it's a wonderful thing to be known, and it's a glorious thing to be known as a child of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know who you are. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. It is truly wonderful to be known as a child of the heavenly father, of almighty God, one whom God cares for, one who knows the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what I think Psalm 8 is about. It's not about butterflies and trees and flowers. Ultimately, it's about the glory of God and the children of God and the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who humbled himself, born of a woman, born under the law, born in humble circumstances, who suffered and died for our salvation, who went to the grave. Oh God, we thank you that he is our salvation. He is the grace of God. He is the good news. He is the gospel. He is salvation for all who believe, who are the children of the heavenly Father. In his name we pray, amen.